Let's move on. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming. Sylvie is gone, so you don't, we don't have Sylvie, but the rest of the crew is here. I'm delighted to be with you. Tonight we embark into, uh, we follow our outline as usual. Turn on page, uh, did the page, page 18. Page 18. Anybody else coming? No. Page 18 of 27, we're doing good. We're doing very well. And those who follow on YouTube, uh, let me check if it works properly. Yes, it does. Uh, thank you for your interest in these class. I sure hope that you are learning a lot for those who watch us online concerning the book of Isaiah. And um, we are doing actually very good with this. So now we have reached, as far as what we have done so far, just a quick word. Being on page 18, we have embarked into the last division, the redemption and uh, restoration of Israel. From chapter 40, verse 1 to 66, 24. And uh, this is the remaining part, and it can be called Second Isaiah. I showed you a slide. I have a few slides for tonight. And we did the prologue of it, covering the theme of Second Isaiah, the famous chapter 40, verse 1, with the three divisions for the remaining part of the book. Uh, basically, our warfare has ended or has completed. The second thing was the iniquity of her. Her iniquity has been removed. And thirdly, she has received of the Lord's hand double for our sin. And I said, you have a lot of notes on the prologue of that division and so on. And then we have seen the question asked and the voices last week, the response, chapter, uh, chapter 40, verses 3 to 11. No need to make a review. We have seen four voices asking questions back and forth and so on. And we have basically covered that in full. For tonight, we will begin the part B, basically, which is that our warfare is accomplished. You have it behind me. From chapter 40, verse 12 to 48, 22. And it's divided in, look at number one, the, uni the unique greatness of Jehovah. Uh, a, B, C, that's what we will cover today. I don't know if we're going to be able to enter into paragraph, not paragraph, but... Uh, chapter 41 but let's take the first chunk the unique the unique greatness of jehovah and turn right away to page 19. so that's the unique greatness of jehovah and let me say just a few things once again covering capital b that her warfare is accomplished just by means of repetition it won't be long and then we move on into is great the greatness of god and so on once again, look, like I just told you right now, this is the first major segment of the rest of the book covering chapter 40, verse 12 to 48, 22. And that's the famous part, our warfare is accomplished. And let me give you again the main points that will come up in these nine chapters that we need to cover. We start tonight. It is written once again in light of the Babylonian captivity. Okay? 150 years down the road, beyond the time of Isaiah. <coughs> it's written in light of the Babylonian captivity, number one. Once again, the con we will see secondly a contrast between Jehovah and idols. A contrast between Jehovah and idols. we will see as we walk, thirdly, a contrast between Israel and the, and the Gentiles. A contrast between Israel and the Gentiles. Number four, a message of deliverance both from Babylon the near and Babylon the far. And I, I will ask you, I know you know. You know what is Babylon the near. It's 150 years beyond Isaiah, which is near. It's not far. And Babylon the far relates to the headquarter of the Antichrist in the end time. So Babylon the city standing needs to be rebuilt. And this is a very important capital in Jewish history and in Bible time. 
And finally, we will see the final overthrow of Babylon or Babylonian idolatry. Babylonian idolatry. That's all I have to say as we begin capital B right now. Arabic number one, the unique greatness of Jehovah. When I write Jehovah myself in my note, I write it this way. You don't have to do this. But that's the easiest way. It takes less time. Yavevute, the Tetragrammaton. Just for note making. And now we talk about his greatness, the greatness of God. In chapter 40, verse 12 to 17. Verse 12 to 17. Come with me. We read. We circle a few things and we will see how it goes. Who has measured the water in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighted the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the spirit of Jehovah or has his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? Behold, the nations, circle the nations, are like drop from the bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like the fine dust. Even Lebanon, circle Lebanon, is not enough to burn nor its beast enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing, circle nothing, before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing, circle nothing, and meaningless. So that's what we embark right now here. As we will see with what I read right now, we will see a series of questions that are rhetorical rhetorical questions. When you write in a rhetorical question way, a rhetorical question basically means that the answer is obvious. It's not a puzzle, it's not a riddle, the answer is obvious. It's not a parable also, way of teaching. You can Google or look in a paper dictionary for the word rhetorical. It's no yes or God only. It demands an answer, and the answer is obvious. In verse 12, we have what we call right here the omnipotence of God. What does it mean to be omnipotent? It means that God is all-powerful, capable of doing everything in verse 12. Who has measured the water in the hollow of his hand? God. And marked off the heavens by the span? God. Do you know what is the span? This is it in the Old Testament. That's it. From the tip of your thumb to the tip of your small finger, that's the span here. And calculated the dust of the earth by the measure. You can imagine for yourself if you go to a grocery store and you weight your bananas and so on, what's the speck on the scale? It does not even affect the weight here. Same for God. And weighted the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scale in verse 12. Here what it does show, it's the omnipotence of God. Who can hold the waters of the earth in the hollow of his hand? If I put water in your hand and you close your hand, you're not going to have much left in your hand, maybe just a sip of something. And he does it. So can you imagine? You can look at that if you want. You can see the earth here and the few planets type of thing. It's a speck for him. So that's why sometimes I give you the sentence that God is not in the universe. It's easy to say, and it makes sense. Oh, God is in the universe. No, it's not proper. The universe is in God because he transcends the universe. That's the one that you worship on Sunday morning. How about the universe? Secondly, 
mark of the heavens by the span. God. I show you my hand. A span in the Old Testament time is about, it's about six inches, seven inches, depending on the size of your hand here. Behold, uh, not his reward right here, calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, weighted the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales. So he can calculate, he can measure the weight of the dust of the earth. We go to Alberta, let's say, when you drive on the flat land and you see the land, the land, the land, the land, and you can imagine, you can see far, 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 you know, that's the prairies and so on. He can measure the dust of the earth. That's omnipotence indeed. We cannot fathom he him here. Even a definition of God you don't even reach the ankle of what it should be. One thing about his greatness, it's one thing about his greatness, because now we're going looking at the greatness of God, and what we have looked at so far is the omnipotence. So for him to make pregnant a virgin person, it's absolutely no effort. To resurrect somebody from the dead, it's no effort. To open the sea for Moses, it's no effort. And to sustain the universe the way it's pivoting together, the way it's solving together, it does not exercise might to do it. He only thinks and it does happen. Same as the creation. This is quite something to reflect upon. In verses 13 and 14, who has directed the spirit of Jehovah? Or as his counselor informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? Now we switch here to omniscience, knowledge. Omniscient, science, knowing, God is all-knowing. He knows everything. You can make a note that is not on my note right now. God does not discover facts. Not F-A-X, but F-A-C-T-S. He does not discover facts at all. He knows them. Did he know about the fall of Satan in Ezekiel chapter 28? Yes, he did. Was he surprised by the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3? He was not. He knew prior to everything what would happen and so on. And again, these are rhetorical questions. When he says, who has directed, directed the mind of Jehovah? No one. Or as his counselor has informed him, none. With whom did he consult and gave him understanding? Nobody. No one. Who taught him? It's no, no, no. Who gives him advice? He does not consult with anyone. And obviously the rhetorical answer is, is no one. I don't know. We cannot, we, can, we will never be able to wrap our mind on these things for the fact that he knows everything like this. It's too huge. The finite mind cannot fathom the greatness of God, how big he is. The brain here, doesn't matter your IQ, it, it cannot enter into us. We're not made for this. We would basically explode completely. So we are very, very finite in comparison to this. We are still impressed when you buy a new laptop computer, how fast it can be when boom, boom, the internet is there. Say, so, whoa, my, my machine is way faster. It's not comparable. It's simply not comparable with the Almighty God that have known you and that you know also and me. Okay? That's the teaching of Isaiah for now. In verses 15 and 16, he talks about the nations that I have chosen. Just a few pictures. Look at the amount of people on the left. Look at the amount. It's impressive. When I saw that, I was impressed, and there was more. You know exactly where they're coming from. The Google. Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket. 
and are regarded as a speck of the dust on the scale. Behold, he lifts up the islands like a fine dust, for even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations, you can look at the screen if you want, are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. You know what's going on on TV right now. It's kind of nice because that's Vladimir Putin, the invasion of uh, Ukraine. At least you don't hear the word COVID when they do that. When they talk about it, you don't, they don't mention the vaccine. Finally, good news. Putin will invade. For God, the meaninglessness of it, if it's a word, it's, it doesn't have to look. He knows what's going on, knows the outcome, knows the result, know the amount of soldiers, know what Canada, uh, uh, what Biden will do. It's, a, it's nothing. It's dust for him. Okay? So he has, uh, here we have the insignificance of the nation in comparison to the greatness of God. He knows, every he knows the amount of hair that these guys, soldiers, have on their, uh, on their thing here. And let me carry you further than that. I just, just, that's what I chose because I don't even know these guys. These guys, I think they look Asian. I'm not quite sure. Probably Japan, Japanese or Chinese. It doesn't matter. What, what, does, what does matter to us, it's to grasp together the planet on which we are in comparison to what I say or wrote about him, the greatness of this God. Go down a little bit, Debbie. I don't like to do a tiny bit, please me, because I, I, the camera is right in the way. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, beautiful, perfect. Yeah. Three major points concerning the nation. Verse 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up his high, uh, the islands like fine dust. Like, so write down concerning verse 15, the smallness, smallness of the nation. They're a drop in the bucket. Dust on the scale. Again, think meat market. And that's, where the, that's what the nation, as nation, are in comparison to him. And we have seen that in the book of Daniel. When we cover Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, with the force and the the capacity and the army multiplying in number, God says, come, let's have fun. Let's wrestle for a little bit. Okay? It's great. Verse 16, the insufficiency. This one is a little bit hard to explain unless you know a little bit of the Holy Land. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn. Circle the word burn. Nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. Circle burnt offering. Okay? They are insufficient in relationship to God once again. Do you know what Lebanon was known for in the past? Cedars. cedars. Beautiful. The trees or cedars are the good, good, uh, good, good thing here. They are worldly known for their cedars, yet all the trees of Lebanon could not burn long enough to provide a sacrifice for him. Even if you gather all the wood of Lebanon, they cannot burn long enough in comparison to his holiness. That's the thing here. That's why I ask you to circle even Lebanon is not enough to burn. That's a play on words with the burnt offering. Nor the animals of Lebanon that hides among the forest of the cedar, even the animals would be completely insufficient to meet his standard. So basically, just put in your note that the trees of Lebanon and the animals in the forest are not enough to sacrifice to his manifold greatness. So that's the insufficiency of nations. I think that our government, you know when I pray on Sunday morning for the government, 
I think all the ministers and the MPs should take Isaiah and read Isaiah, then continue in their position only after having studied it, to understand how small but how in need of leaders we are, in a sense. I'm not belittling here. Verse 17, the nothingness. All the nation are as nothing before him. And the three Hebrew words that you have here, as nothing before him, they are regarded by him less than nothing, nothing and meaningless. Circle them. Circle nothing, another nothing, and meaningless here. When you read the Hebrew, they are the same word as in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. That the earth became voice, void, wasteless, and emptiness. That's how he sees the nation in front of him. Don't ask me if he cares. Don't ask me this. Of course he does. He chooses people, even unbelievers, to, to achieve his purposes about, because he can also use the sinfulness of men with the sinful actions of men, think, think Adolf Hitler, to bring his purposes about. He cares. There is believers in all the nations and so on, but we cannot boast in power in comparison to his greatness. So in verses 12 to 17, right now, the point was the greatness of God in comparison to the smallness, insufficiency, and the nothingness of the nations, the Gentile nation and so on. At this point, we are ready to take parenthetical lowercase b, the incomparableness of God, 18 to 26. By 18 to 26, now I'm going to start to go only verse by verse here. The incomparableness is not comparable. Verse 18. To whom then will you liken me? Or what likeness will you compare with him? Here. Now in this section, further down in 19 to 20, God is beginning to compare himself with idols. That's all the information that I gave you in the introductory material of the second Isaiah. This is here, now you can see the truth of, was, of what was being taught here, a comparison between Jehovah and with the idols. To whom then will you liken me, or what likeness will you compare with him? That's the likeness of idolatry. Here, whether you like it or not, is using Jewish humor and irony. He is using Jewish rumor in the next two verses, and also Irony, 19 to 20. When you finish your notes, give you a sec, and we read 19 to 20, we circle a few things. As for the idol, a craftsman cast it, circle cast it if you want. A goldsmith plated with gold, circle gold. And a silversmith, of course, fashioned chain of silver. He who is too impoverished for such an offering Select a tree that does not rot. Circle, circle select a tree that does not rock, rot. He seeks out for himself a skillful craftsman, circle skillful craftsman, to prepare an idol that will not totter. Like I said and I repeat to you, here is using a bit of Jewish humor and irony here. Some people that fall in idolatry, they can buy expensive gods, small g, overlaid with gold and silver. That's for the rich. Overlaid with gold and silver. Amulets, totems, whatever you call it. That's for the rich. 
Others are cheap, not even capable of paying for anything. And they go to the forest and they look for a tree that will not rot, a good hardwood, like the arbutus and so on. And then these that, that would not rot, ROT. Yeah. And then they look for a good carver, a good, a skillful craftsman to make the bad look nice. Because a god, small g, an idol, has to look nice. So they look for a good, skillful person to make the bad look nice. And then in verse 20 here, they look for a base for it to prepare an idol that will not totter. So fix my post or whatever I get carved and so on on, the, on a good strong base because you don't want God to fall. Make it solid, a screw from underneath type of thing that the thing may st stand upright. So the God has to look good. And in Hebrew, there is a lots of irony here. It's basically said this, make me a good job with that piece of wood. That's what they say to the skillful person. Do a good job for me. Make it look nice. Don't make a mouse, my God. And in verse 21 onward here, In verses 21 onward here, we will see some facts, certain facts about God's incomparableness after he said all these things here. We will see some facts about God being incomparable. We'll take it one by one. Verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? In verse 21, this one talks about God's eternity. This one talks about God's eternity. It is another of his attribute. He is eternal backward and eternal future. Us, we are eternal only future, not backward because we came into being. What I would like you to note here is talking about Gentile idolaters here, not the Jews. Do you not know, have you not heard, has it not been declared from the beginning, it from the beginning, it's way from the beginning of having a Jewish nation. Goes back to Adam and Eve and onward. So from the beginning, this God was there. From the very creation of everything, he was there. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden. Everything was created in order to make a place suitable for them. So basically, because of what he says here, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth here? How can you even think about building small gods for you out of wood? And then to ascribe to it the creations of the earth. Think about the city of totems here. It's pure idolatry. Pure and simple. First of all, it's ugly. And they are all kinds of God ascribed with creations and so on and so forth. So have you not understood that I was there from the beginning? Seek me. There is a creator. And if a person is seeking to live out up to God, God will give him more revelation. A person who is seeking properly, but you know Romans chapter 1. Basically, they stop from worshiping the creator to worship the create Ted. 
And as soon as you do a totem or a bird or whatever it could be, that's idolatry. It's ascribing value or honor to something created. A bald eagle, name it. It's difficult for me to say that specifically where we live, and some of you might like these things, but they are nevertheless unacceptable as far as worship is concerned. And when a person that comes to faith, they need to stay away from this because this is satanic. That's why discipleship is important. It's very ingrained into cultures of the people. Okay, how do you think about building your little gods out of wood than to ascribe to it the creation of heavens and the earth, worshiping nature, and so on and so forth? So we don't need to look far. Isaiah is very, very pertinent for today. We don't need to look far. We're surrounded by this. In verse 22, 22 it is he, capital H, who sits above the circle of the earth. Or, the, 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 Debbie, do you have the word vault? No. Who has vault? Good. I like it. And its, and its inhabitants are like grass hopper, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spread them out like a tent to dwell in. So now it shows his transcendence. God transcends everything. Everything. He is transcendent. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. I was, I Google vault in Google picture and they were showing me vault to keep the money and to keep jewelry safe. But the real one, it's round here. So the old theory that the earth was flat here, a vault in construction, it's an arc, that's a half moon type of thing of a roof like this. That's what we call a vault, you know that. This is your language. So here, the earth was never flat. The earth was round, a vault, a circle, 22A. Beside my word circle here, I have a little tiny number two, and it says vault. I like it, the word vault, but it needs to be explained properly. So if the inhibitants here are like grasshopper, how much less are the real grasshopper? And he knows them. Imagine the inhabitants, it's you and I. And he looks from afar, from the third heaven, the abode of Christ right now, where Christ is sitting as a person there. And they see us, they read my mind, he read, they, the Trinity, read my mind and everything. So imagine the ants and the little spider in that last room that I have in the corner, that when we clean, you see them climbing and so on. They're not very happy camper. He knows if it's a female and how many eggs they have in the belly. Mm. Love that kind of knowledge. And we need less to tell you that you are way more precious than the ant. A spider, what do we do? All girls just bang, bang, bang with the shoes because she shuns spiders. And you don't do it to a human person. And I don't think it displeases God when you, you kill the bee. You don't drive your car in the summertime because your bumper is full of dead flies on it. Don't want to kill animals? Don't drive, please. And when you, when you say to the people that their pet don't go to heaven or they get upset, they want to see their cat, how about the bee on the bumper? Preach the gospel to them. No. Unnecessary. Verse 22b Okay, 22b, it says this in 22b here. Who stretches out the heaven like a curtain and spread out a tent like, uh, and spread them out like a tent to dwell in here. As a man can easily spread a veil. I have a little tent for Sophia that is round and you, you can do it in your bookshelf. You know, you, you just twist it. It's a, a, a thing. Uh, and, you, and when you unfold the tent, you unzip it and you just release <laughs> And the tent is there, is there in the same way. You stretch it out. Put it out of the box. And, and it was there. Same amount of effort that it takes for me to undo the little Sophia's tent here. He did it with no. He spread out the heavens. But you cannot teach that. 
So I teach that in uh, some churches in Victoria and some in, in, in the valley here. They teach that the creation is an allegory of something. They don't, they don't take it literal. So I cannot preach there on Sunday morning and ask me to do a message on creation. They allegorize it. So if you have a pastor, ask them, do you allegorize the, uh, the account of, uh, of uh, creation? If he says yes, you're in trouble. If he says no, it's a literal 24 hours, good. But some churches, I won't name it, major churches, all the pastors at that place on Vancouver Island, they allegorize the account of creation. It was just an allegory and they question if Moses wrote it. So how come they don't go to Isaiah, the spreading of the tent like this? He could have done that in, in, in six days, six hours or six seconds. He chose days because he probably knew that we would like days. There was an evening and the morning. 24 hours. Oh, yeah, but uh, the oil in the middle takes millions of years, so there might be millions of years between these days. Mm. Starts with the B. Read my mind. Unacceptable. It's not what it says here. Who stretches out the heaven like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in? Okay. Verses 23 and 24 we have here. Okay. It is he who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted. You have not even. Instead of scarcely, you can put not even. Not even have they been planted. Not even have they been sown. Not even has their stock taken root in the earth. But he merely blows on them and they wither, and the storm carries them away like stubble here. Men can easily be removed, and it's good as well for sure, for this here. You know, Adolf Hitler, when he did, 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 did the war in Russia, uh, the German army, they were good with steel. They are rich in steel, these guys still are, but their boots were not warm enough. They lost the battle. Napoleon lost the battle because of the cold. And Adolf Hitler lost the battle because of the cold. It was the breath of the Almighty. Minus 25. And they died frozen on, that, on the battlefield. That's what a strong army is for him. Now let's decrease the thermostat a little bit. Pretty chilly, eh? Cannot hold on the gun. Your fingers are frozen. War is won. Hitler is gone. Job. Have you entered the storehouses of, of snow, Job, that I've kept for the day of battle? It's as if it's written after WW2. <laughs> he says this, chapter 38. Hey, Job, how are you doing? Did you enter the storehouses of snow and the ice, which I reserve for the day of battle? What's the book, Job? Where is it located? Right after Revelation. Uh, 25. His unequalness answer is no. Verse 25. To whom then will you liken me that I sh would be his equal, says the Holy One. It's basically uh, to nobody, to no one. Verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. Beautiful, eh? Not really clear. Let's do it. Let's for fun. Okay, Lewis, you name them one by one. Start here. Give them a name. Just to pick on you. Okay? What does it say here? Francois, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. And the word stars in Italic, it's these. But it alludes to the star. The one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name. Ooh. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, none of them is missing. Should be are missing, but it is missing. That's the most crisp picture that I could get. This one is Adolf, Harold. This one I don't see enough. And he does the same thing for us. Do you know what I would like to show you? 
give me a second, I will show that to you. It's impressive. I'm pretty sure you have seen in the past. Let, let, just, just, just count them. Apparently, there, there is, there are, in our constellation, 100, 100 billion stars. Just in our, the, the Milky Way. You know what I'm talking about? I googled it. But I wanted to show you something fun. Look at this. Current world population. Seven billion nine hundred and twenty four million five hundred and ninety three thousand three hundred and sixty seventy people. He knows the amount of hair that they have on their head. Seven billion human beings on this planet. Very few are chosen. Go, go ahead. Sure, do it. You don't want to hear this word. Even with COVID? Uh, what's the point? <laughs> this is the, the, the you have the, 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 when you scroll down, you have the death, I think. Today, 300. Population growth today, population growth this year. No. Yeah, death this year. Five million. That's an of course, it's just, as, we, as we speak, people are born and I we speak. But it's not my point. My point was this, that I cannot recuperate right now, the stars that he names them. Uh, are the stars redeemable? Can they go to heaven? You're already in heaven. Do you evangelize the stars? Not at all. That doesn't count for him. But how about these seven billion people here that he knows also? The message is for them as well. And all of the people of the past. Think, make your, put your hat of imagination. Have fun a little bit for a moment. If he can name the stars, which are nothing. Go there on the stars. You will not discover life there. There is no life apart from this planet. This planet is the only planet suitable made for men to breathe on. He doesn't care for the other planet. They're a bunch of dust. They, they, they guide our way by night and they're beautiful to see. It's God's creation. But how about these guys being born right now? In poverty, in wealth, type of thing. I like it. I will keep it just for my own because uh, 7 billion here. And apparently, the, the, the stars in our constellation estimated, because who knows about, they say 100 billion stars. It's a tiny bit more than that. And he names them. So, what is it for him to name everybody there at 7 billion? Yes, thank you so much for having answered that. I don't want you to look at this because you're not going to listen to me. <laughs> we pause. We pause a little bit. My throat is giving.